This is Ian P. Reports, a vodcast from Editor and Publisher Magazine, the authoritative voice of news media since 1884, serving newspapers, broadcast, digital, and all forms of news publishing. And greetings once again, Mike Linder, publisher, ENP Magazine. As always, I start with housekeeping, meaning if if you're listening to this program on your favorite podcast platform, please follow us. Watching on YouTube, well, there's a subscribe button below me. There's a bell to the right. Hit them, smash them, click them, do something. <laughs> you'll do anything. You'll get an update each and every time we upload a new episode of this weekly vodcast series, E&P Reports. John Slice, I feel, did I say that correctly, sir? John Slice. Yeah, that's it. I, I feel guilty, sir. You should have been on this program a, a while ago. We have not reached out to you. We should have. We we have editorially. You were part of our of our February cover story on unions. John Schloys, those of you that don't know him, president of the News Guild Communications Workers of America. John, welcome to the program in our audience. Thanks so much for having me. Um, my 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 backside's been hurting, and I want you to help me with that. I'm not not physically, but it has. It's a metaphor. I've been sitting on a fence. <laughs> and the fence hurt. I mean, for example, when the Pittsburgh strike, you know, was big news, the, the the business journal in Pittsburgh, you know, reaches out to me. I guess they found me on Google. Hey, he publishes the magazine of the newspaper industry. How do you feel about the strike? Immediately, we say, we'll call him back. We put out a press release. There are two sides to this coin. You see, the fence, you know, we support journalism, all shapes and stripe. We believe in its value, but we understand the hardships of running a business and what have you. I want you to help me during this program to come down off the fence. Do you think you can do that? Oh, I mean, I, as a as a, a journalist, I mean, like my job is just to seek facts and truth and report it out. So I, I'm I'm here for open minds and and, and bringing facts. All right, we're going to do that together as we explore um, the world of guilds, um, unions, uh, news publishing. Uh, it's necessity in our society and what the heck's going on with all the strikes going on today. With your permission, we'll do that together on the backside of this message. This episode of ENP Reports is exclusively sponsored by Blocks Digital, formerly Town News. Even though the name has changed, their commitment to the media industry is as strong as ever. Blocks Digital is now even better positioned to deliver integrated solutions like content management, audience development, advertising revenue, video management, and more. Join the over 2,000 news publishers worldwide that power their ongoing digital transformation with Blocks Digital, serving over 141 million monthly users who view over 6.5 billion pages of content each year. You can trust Blocks Digital to empower you, to connect you at scale with the community you need to reach. Blocks Digital, formerly Town News, now reimagined to help meet the news publishing challenges of tomorrow and beyond. Learn more at blocksdigital.com. All right, John, before we get into the meat of this thing, let's first discuss your background. You um, you came out of, into the industry at the young age of what, 21 at one of my favorite newspapers. I worked there as a consultant for five years, for WECO, for um, um, uh, Walter Husson, we're talking about the Northwest Arkansas uh, a Democrat, right? Yeah, the, well, the Democrat Gazette, yeah, right. but that's, I mean, you know, I, I love how newspapers, you know, after mergers have these, like, kind of big monolithic, like, media names, the Arkansas Democrat Gazette. Right. Yeah, so I, I was, like, my first job, I actually, like, sort of halfway dropped out of school to, to, to take the job as the online editor, I guess in the late 2000s and it was it was really fun because I was just like a, a guy who knew how to like do things on the internet and I was like on Twitter before like a lot of other people were and uh and was also like kind of an aspiring blogger and journalist and uh I got I got a job basically being like can you help us like do this online journalism thing and so that was that was my first job at the, the Northwest Arkansas Dim Gas. And then you wound up I guess this is where maybe the the guild or the union 
and you kind of came together at the LA Times. Am I right? Because that you were there in the digital side at the LA Times. That's right. Yeah. So I joined in 2013, and I think we were still in bankruptcy when uh, you know Tribune was still like one company, or was just being split up between like the broadcasting and the publishing arm of the companies. Uh, and I was brought in uh, on the graphics and sort of data teams uh, as a as a innovator in finding new ways to tell digital stories uh, online. You know, we were under Tribune Publishing. Tribune Publishing was sort of refashioned as Tronc, which had been like the most ridiculous name in the industry. Uh, we were forming our union in in late 2016, really got off uh, on, on it on 2017, um, built a union basically kind of from scratch, working with the News Guild, uh, the union now I'm president of. Uh, and then we, we organized, we went public in 2018. Uh, the big change at the beginning was the move from the downtown newsroom on Spring Street to El Segundo. So it was, we lo jokingly called it the Los Angeles Times of El Segundo. All right. So here we are in 2023. Uh, and congratulations on your ascension. You are president of a, of a guild that has a lot of heritage and history. Um, I, I, do you feel that when you go to work? I mean, do you, do you understand, you know, you, what you got to say, almost 100 years. You yeah, well, helped. This is our 90th year in existence. We were formed back in 1933 by a bunch of uh, uh, goofy journalists who were really upset about the idea of consolidation, of uh, lack of job protections, of uh, pay discrepancies across the board. Oh my God, does it sound like today's uh, situation? No, exactly. Too? But they formed it 90 years ago. So I feel I feel like I'm constantly being haunted by the people who were much better than me that came before us to found this great union and, and build it into something that I could plug into and along with like thousands of other members, try to try to make our mission continue forward. Your um, briefly give me the elevator pitch. It is huge right now, correct? How many members? How many media companies are you working with right now? So we uh, we represent twenty six thousand members in the U.S., Canada, and Puerto Rico um, at four hundred and sixty eight different work locations. Um, mm -hmm. Like so, you know, that's fifty different newsrooms in Gannett. Uh, we represent workers at the, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, the LA Times, San Francisco Chronicle, uh, you name it. Most newsrooms in this country are unionized with us, but we also represent small publications like the Boise, Idaho Statesman, uh, the Casper, Wyoming Tribune, um, just kind of all across the country, Dallas Morning News, Fort Worth, uh, Star-Telegram. Uh, and, and we also represent a lot of folks who are not in media. We represent nonprofit workers at ACLU affiliates or uh, Spanish and uh, other language interpreters in California, uh, Illinois, uh, Minneapolis. Um, so we represent a lot of other different types of workers, nonprofit staff unions, too. Um, we work, represent workers at the uh, AFL-CIO uh, as well. Um, so it's a big it's a big, good family to be a part of. All right. I want to I don't want to. I'm going to take one side of the argument now. Um, I am a publisher right now, and I wasn't a publisher until four years ago. Suddenly, I'm a publisher with expenses. I want to do the best journalism I can, John. I really do. I want to serve this industry the best I can. But when you start working a business, bodies and journalists are just like other expenses. And we're out for a mission, my wife and I. We're a very small company, but we pay quality journalists. I wish I could pay them more, but you understand there are some months where we don't take a dime out of this thing, my wife and I. We made our, I mean, so, but we're looked at as sometimes as the rich guys that bought the magazine, do you understand? Where we're just trying to keep it alive. And I know other news publishers who are close friends of mine who don't make a lot of money. I mean, some of them haven't taken a profit in ages because they feel the mission. Does that make sense? They, it's not just a business. It's it's a, it's part of our democratic fabric for this republic, to have that that final check on power. You know that 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 for the state for the state in in in, in business. Do you have empathy for that? Before we get into this, do you understand where the industry is today? Big tech blowing off tons of local revenue, the loss of inserts. Um, I'm losing all of that classified revenue or the past 15 years, some of that may be self-inflicted by our industry's inability to grow as quickly as we could into the digital space. But do you have empathy for that? Oh, I mean, it's we share the feeling. I mean, journalists are the watchdogs of Americans, 
America's democracy. That is like our, our ultimate goal. And whether you're the publisher trying to make sure that things are covered, you know, at the city council meeting or at the school board meeting or high school sports, or that like they're, you're making sure that you're doing a deep investigation into a company that's spilling toxic chemicals into a local river. We have a duty in this country to make sure that we're actually uplifting our communities, telling their stories and holding power to account. And, and that's true all across the board. But I think of myself as a as an actual team player and like trying to forge that future in the future, uh, build a future that we can actually all rely on. You're one of the outliers in the fact that like so much of the industry is turned into a financial instrument by hedge funds and private equity that don't care about the things that you and I care about. So that's, that's been the real, real let's issue to kind of let's, crack. Let's, cause we're no friend of that either at ENP. I mean, we're right now in the middle of doing exposés on ghost paper. Um, uh, last month we um we have uh, I've done interviews. You know Evan Brandt? Does that name ring a bell? Yeah, um, Pottstown, and he's that's the Alden. Yeah, Evan Brandt. He's one of our great activists and members in Pottstown, Pennsylvania. Right. He's the last living journalist at a suburban Philadelphia paper that used to have forty or fifty in the newsroom. Um, and he agrees with you that the challenge is corporate greed. Um, I spent um, about 15 minutes watching you on a YouTube video you recorded two weeks ago. And the message there resonated with me. I'm going to I'm going to throw a little smoke your way. It's my show. I can do whatever the hell I want. But you didn't just talk about, you know, making money for your your team. You focused on how Gannett. Because the, the whole thing was focused on Gannett, correct? That, give me the back. Yeah, it was the, it was the share. It was for shareholders. Yes. Right. It was basically saying Mike Reed's got to go. And That's you did right. not pull punches. You just you said, I am the I am the president of this huge guild. This guy's ruining. But you didn't say he's ruining the company as much as he's ruining democracy. I mean, that was your real core message, was it not? I mean, that's what you were trying to really get out. Then you said, of course, and your share prices are down because this company is not doing its job. Is that how you really feel? Is that I mean, give me a little background on that. Put some meat on the it bone. It is. It goes back to my roots growing up in rural Arkansas. You know, I, I grew up in a town called Harmony Grove, which you, you would struggle to even find on Google Maps. Um, and it's not much of a town. It's like a four way stop. There's no stoplights in that town. There's a gas station about a mile away and a school and like a couple of churches. But, you know, I grew up with a grandmother who was an avid news consumer. So she would, you know, watch the evening news or the uh, you know nightly news with Peter Jennings. And right. she subscribed to a morning paper, the Arkansas Democrat Gazette, and an afternoon paper, the Camden News, both owned by Waco or WECO. And um, anyway, uh, you know, so I, I grew up in a culture where she was extremely plugged in her community, and that really affected me. Uh, she also was a volunteer at uh, the, the Methodist Church every election season to make sure that she was there as a poll uh, support and a poll staffer to make sure, you know, that uh, that people got to vote in their democracy. And so I grew up with like a really amazing role model who made me realize that, you know, we have a duty to promote democracy if we want to have American way of life. Like we have to make sure that we're supporting free and fair and open elections. And we also have to make sure that we're providing the news to the people who actually vote uh, so that they know what issues they they should stand on and how, how to stand and like what's affecting them in their community. So to me, any any part, you know, if, if it's if it's Apollo Global Management, which created the situ situation by funding the Gatehouse Gannett merger and Mike Reed's you know, mismanagement of Gannett, uh, any threat to that, whether it's them, whether it's all in global capital, whether uh, it's even the Block family in Pittsburgh, which is a family owned newspaper. Those folks are actually fighting our very democracy. Uh, by 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 hurting journalists, by affecting journalists. And when journalists unionize across the board, and you know, we've had more than 6,000 unionized in the last five years. I mean, that that's just not happened since our founding back in 1933. But when they unionize, they usually have a mission statement. And typically that mission statement says that they are trying to unionize to safeguard their publication for their community. And because that is that's huge. Be, but the the, back, the the backbone of unionization, let's go way back now, goes back to an unregulated government and the fact that the rich got richer, the poor got poorer, no one was working out for the working man. Let's hear it for Jimmy Hoffa, rah, rah, rah. You see what I'm saying? I mean, back in the 20s, you'd be called a communist if you, if you get my drift. You're saying now with that statement that ad comma, despite the publisher in control that maybe we have to help continue this mission because ownership doesn't see it? 
question mark. What say you? Yeah, I mean, that's that's why we unionized at the LA Times. I remember when my colleagues, you know, were in a chat, we had we had just kind of experienced like a series of new management and a bunch of cuts to our benefits and wages. And my colleague uh, put into like the Slack channel at work that we were losing our paid time off accrual, which was just a benefit that we had that was just stripped away unilaterally. And it was sort of the last straw. And my colleague said, maybe we should form a union. I think he kind of threw it out there like as a joke, but I like got up and walked over to him and I was like, yeah, how do we form a union? What's that? <laughs> I didn't know anything. And so we just started asking questions um, because we wanted to have a say in our workplace. We wanted to be able to actually have a voice because we love the Los Angeles Times. We wanted to care for it. We wanted to save it for the community in Southern California, but we know that it was such a a heavy hitter in terms of the democracy and the fabric of society in Southern California and all of California, we wanted to save it. So that's when we started building a union. All right. Here's, here's my conundrum. In a perfect world, management and workers would see this common goal, correct? And there would be no need to form that union. You would work together because the logic would be there that the LA Times requires all of us to hold hands, sing Kumbaya, and move forward with the mission. As a manager, as someone with a lot of equity invested in publishing a, a news product, you're basically calling me stupid. You're saying, you can't do this on your own. You don't see the trenches we're in. Is that what I'm hearing? I think these are the stages of grief you're experiencing, right? Where it's like, and this happens like whenever a new group unionizes, it feels like a personal attack, right? That like, oh, they're unionizing because I'm- I, I'm stupid. stupid. Yeah. yeah, but it's usually not the case, right? It's, it's, it's a question of like that kumbaya. How do we actually get to the place where we actually work together collectively? And there's this handy tool in American uh, labor law that allows folks to come together and say, you know, here's what we're thinking. You know, here's what we want to do. We want, we want, you know, like say at the New York Times, we want raises of 10.6% for everyone at minimum. We want a minimum salary floor of $65,000. We've been having conversations with our colleagues and we think these are the best things that we'd like to do. We come to the table, management comes to the table, we negotiate, we get to an agreement at some point. We don't win everything. We don't win all the things that both sides want, but we try to build something collectively together knowing that the power dynamics are kind of radically shifted in one way, usually for management, right? So we come together as a collective, but that's really a collective for the entire news company to try and move things forward, to try to safeguard something. We're running out of time and I'm honored to have you here, sir. So I'm gonna do a little speed dating with you now, if I may, or speed interviewing. Not to take I'm too taken, long. I'm and, taken, so I'm not- I'm a, I'm I'm So am I, I'm happily married and she helps me run the business. But I'm gonna discuss recent- strike issues going on. One of the things I love about you, I'm blowing more smoke, is I read that you're rarely home. I'm sure you're, you're constantly on the road. You're supporting a lot of your members by going into those cities and spending time there. Pittsburgh, we just mentioned the Block family, John Block himself. That strike is still ongoing in Pittsburgh, correct? Are you spending a lot of time there? What's the skinny? What's going on there? Yeah, so it strikes me going on nine months. When it began, I basically, you know, I'm, I'm back in my apartment literally probably for 36 hours back in D.C., but, um, uh, you know, that strike began in, in October of last year. I was immediately there. We had a bunch of staff there. We were basically pulled building a plan to quickly, like, support our, our members and support the journalists in Pittsburgh uh, to fight back. You know, the company uh, is, seems to be clearly uh, focused on on exhaustion and exhaustion of the workers, of the, of the journalists, but then also exhausting their legal mechanisms, which are very slow, right? Uh, the company uh, violated the law by illegally imposing terms. We have a federal judge who said so. Um, they also like illegally stripped people of their health insurance, uh, including like, you know, a single mother of two kids and, and folks who have, you know, cancer. Uh, and so they, they've kind of acted in these unilateral ways uh, we're continuing to support them. We're fighting them in every single front that we can, including the legal mechanisms, because that seems to be where they're they're focused on. It's just, let's just go through the, the legal mechanisms completely. All right. And finally, we'll bring it all home with Gannett. Um, you didn't get a good vote, right? You guys went nuts. Not nuts. Excuse me. That, I'll edit that out or maybe leave it so I can have my own mistake. You did a lot um, the day of, uh, uh, you guys had a one day strike, correct? You put out that, uh, that uh, webinar for the shareholders, your goal was to have a vote of non-confidence for the CEO, Mike Reed, and he's still in power. 
right? There's, are you giving up? What's going on? Well, you know, I'd question what still in power is. Uh, if you run a company and all the journalists completely despise you, I wouldn't say that's power. Uh, okay. So, so yeah, his his title is CEO of uh, Gannett for now, um, but I think he's pretty much a clear disgrace uh, to the entire industry. Um, so, you know, we we lobbied shareholders. We increased the, the withholding vote, you know, a little bit from last year, but he only needed one vote, which probably could have been one of his shares to continue in this position. Uh, we're going to continue to be laser focused on Mike Reed. Uh, he's, you know, we just had a huge win with 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 his his former family over at Tegna, you know, that used to be part of Gannett. And we just uh, beat a hedge fund back, which was funded by Apollo Global Management, the same private equity firm that funded this disastrous merger between yeah, that- well, John, I got to tell you, um, I'm off the fence, all right? You did, you did an amazing job for me breaking down why it's not a question of right versus wrong, good versus bad, um, workers just calling the owners fat cats. Um, you did a good choice, a job uh, convincing me, hopefully some of my audience as well, that maybe there's a day coming, should I say this, that we're all holding hands and singing Kumbaya and working together and maybe that would put you out of a job? Oh, that would be my dream. I really just want to get back into working in a newsroom, honestly. Like, I I, I feel honored to be able to, like, represent America's journalists and I love doing it. Uh, but, you know, this this keeps me up at night. This, this, is, a, this is a hundred hour a week kind of job, I'm, you know. Just last week on Friday for the insider strike, you know, I, I flew, I drove to the airport, got there, you know, started left, left at 3 a.m., got to the airport, flew to New York, was there for the rally and the picket and the start of the strike and then flew back home uh, to be there with our members. I mean, it's it's a lot, but that's that's the power of America's journalists. They are fed up and they are hungry for 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 something good to happen in our industry. And so I, 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 I am optimistic. I'm always optimistic because I think that there is the potential for us to to find revenue solutions out of it. I am constantly thoughtful on like the fact that we can come together with really good ideas to solve our problems because damn it, it's it's our democracy that's at stake, like like you said. John Shalois, right? I got that right. Uh, President of the News Guild Communication Workers of America. Thank you for your valuable time and we'll be staying in touch. Thanks so much for having me and I'm happy to be back anytime.